OK. Uh, just as a, well, you'll see. OK, well, then I will commence, blinded by the lights. Hi, my name's John Bellinger. Um, three years ago, my best friend from college and I co-founded a startup called the LLC. We design and make power electronics. We do hobby robot parts. We do DC-DC converters for mostly hackers, things of that nature. And we do radio control airplane stuff. Um, for the past three years, we've been running a startup, we've been growing a startup, we've been living a startup, we've been dying a startup. So I thought I would come here, because I was cajoled into it, and talk to you a little bit about startuping. And um, this is where the presentation's going to be a little bit weird, because I hate podiums. I hate, I am the authority figure. You shall all get out your notebooks and write down. This is how I start a startup. The guy with the hair said, first, you make a business plan. You do make a business plan. I will get to that. But startuping is impetuous. If you can't say, hey, you don't know anything about anything, you're not going to start a startup because you'll say, they're established. I can't beat them. Startuping is it's spontaneous. You, you have to roll with things. There's no, well, I'll just sit on it for a couple weeks because in a couple weeks, somebody else will solve the problem. Because the problem is your problem. The company is your company. And in two weeks, you may be dead. So how many people here are here because you're seriously considering or have at any point considered, I should start a company? I'm, I'm a damn smart guy or a girl, and I should start a company. Anybody? If you have, stand up. OK, of everybody standing up, how many of you own a house? No, you, know, you can stay standing up. Raise your hand if you do. OK. Um, every, whoever owns a house or doesn't own a house, how many of you own a car? If you own a car and you're thinking of standing, starting up, stay standing up. Sit down if you're willing to lose both. Startuping is hard. It's, there's really no way you could prepare yourself for it. But if you're not willing to go all in every day, and by all in, I mean in the poker sense, this is all my money, this is all my effort, this is all my time, these are all my relationships in the world, and they're in the pot, I can't get them back except by winning, then startuping is the way to go. If you can't do that, get a job. It's more lucrative, it's faster, it's a hell of a lot easier. OK, so having started here, this is my talk, these are my rules, and the rules are you have to be interactive. The reason I started a startup, well, I'll get into, but part of it is I thought I was more clever than whoever was doing whatever I was doing before. So if you're going to start a startup, you have to think you're more clever than me. So at any point, for any reason, interrupt me. Say, hey, blonde dude, or John, or yo, asshole up front, I want you to stop. I want you to give me information. I want you to tell me something. I want to argue with you. If nobody interrupts me for too long, then I'm just going to stop. Isn't that why not? I started a company. You do not have to sacrifice everything. You can start, you know, two hours a week. I mean, you can do whatever you want to. Is this not hot? Okay, that's cool. Um, now it's hot. I'm going to disagree with you. Um, I'll get back to that. Do you want, or do you want to do that now? OK, I'll get back to that, because I'm going to disagree completely. But this is the great thing about startups. I'm not necessarily right. He's not necessarily right. If both of us live off of our income, we're right. And if neither of us live off our income, we're wrong. There is no, well, I'm being underpaid here in a startup. And there is no, I deserve better in a startup. There is whatever you can get by clawing and scratching and fighting and biting and kicking and whatever methods you have to get to. They're, the great thing about startups is, there's no, well, somebody screwed me out of it. Did somebody screw you out of it? Hell yes. People try to screw you all the time. But at the end of the day, there's you and you and your business partner, if you have a business partner, and 
whatever. But there's no, there isn't any externalities that don't come right back to you. So, yeah, if, if you want to interrupt me, interrupt me. Great, because I love to debate, and I'm not necessarily right. I have three years of startup experience with this one under my belt. I haven't gone bankrupt yet, but we could tomorrow. So interrupt, interact, say you're wrong, or say I want more information. I know a few things anymore because I've been doing it for three years. So if you're seriously thinking about starting a startup, ask me. I'm offended if you say, what do you take home in a year? Not a hell of a lot. OK, so why did I do this? Why did I say there's not? going to be any me working for Lockheed Martin or whatever. Why, why did I start a startup? And the reality of the situation is I started a startup because I graduated college with a degree in mechanical engineering in 2004. The people who were hiring were defense, 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 and defense. I don't have anything against defense necessarily. Defense does have something against me. You walk in and say, hi, I'm, I'm real clever. I'm going to work for you on a missile system. They'll be like, hi, you've got hair halfway down to your ass. You're blonde, you're impetuous, and you don't like um, traditional power structures. Uh, we're not hiring you so much. So why I started a startup is partially because it had been something I'd always been planning on doing. This is part of the problem in the interview process. Hi, uh, what do you see yourself doing in five years? Running a company? Oh, well, we'll, uh, we'll get you. The, the correct answer was engineer grade three. The hell did I know? So anyway, senior year. I graduated with all these, I graduated from Carnegie Mellon University with great commendations, and I won some awards saying, you are the greatest engineer of your graduating class. Thanks, now I'm unemployed. So anyway, a buddy of mine and I said, OK, no time like the present, we'll start a company. That was May. We legitimately started starting the company in that we were incorporated in November. What did we do in the interim? In the interim, we did a number of things, which are very important groundwork, which I'm going to go over. Because if you're starting a startup, you kind of need to do this. And if you want to disagree with me, knock yourself out, because that's what I'm here for. But first thing you need to do if you're right, starting a startup is write a business plan. It's boring. It's bullshit. It's absolutely not going to have any basis in reality. But if your business plan doesn't say, yeah, I'll be a millionaire by the age of 30, your chances of being a non-homeless guy by the age of 30, not so hot. So you've got to write a business plan. And there are any number of ways to write a business plan. Ours was actually fairly involved because we were doing a tech company. So we actually, before we started, said, these are the markets we want to be in. These are the products we're thinking of making. These are how long it will take, how it will cost. We did about six months of pre-company product design, product development, research, what can we actually do? And the other question is that we had to answer was, how do you do this? Because we were engineers. We were newly minted. We knew some about very little. Did we know anything about the mechanics of manufacturing thousands of surface mount electronics? No. Did we know anything about hiring managers? No. Did we know anything about? Well, really, anything. And the answer was, not a hell of a lot. We knew some technical stuff. They taught us technical shit. No, they, 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 they taught us how to learn technical shit, I guess. Say again? I'm, I'm not going to say that. If I hadn't gone to college, I would definitely not be standing here, because I wouldn't have had the technical skills that have gotten me through my lack of understanding of business things have gotten me through my complete lack of the technical stuff, because our, my company was started by two engineers. The technical stuff is our core. That's what we come back to when we're screwed. And being a startup, you know how often you're screwed? Always. You are always one misstep from, well, I guess I'm uh, thoroughly fucked. And that's, that's how you live. And that's how, the, how you live for the entire time you're going, because as you grow, you know, thoroughly fucked might be some guy didn't pay me $500 two years ago. Thoroughly fucked is right now I have a customer who ordered $9,000 worth of stuff, decided, oh, I'm an idiot and don't know how to make it work. It's custom for you, so I can't send it back, but I'm not going to pay you. Okay. 
I, do you have a resolution for that one? No. But that's not, you get to the point where you're growing, you're growing, you're growing. The whole time we've been two weeks, maybe a month worth of no revenue from, from dead. And your dead, your two weeks of revenue goes from, you know, 500 bucks a month to $40,000 a month, which is where we're sitting right now. But we're still two weeks from dead. Now, what I'm going to get into is I'm going to disagree with you about starting full time. Because this is one of the things that I'm personally, I've started, I'm 26 now. I've sort of started four businesses um, way back when, when was dial up and there were BBSs, if you can remember that, when I was about 14 or so, I was running a BBS. I think probably half the people here were running a BBS. We decided, oh, we're going to get into internet access just because, you know, there isn't too much around and blah, 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 and local content was the hot thing. And we, so I was 16, I was trying to be in school. My brother was 14, trying to be in school. That tanked. That tanked so hard it wasn't funny. And it tanked because we, one, were 16 and 14. We didn't know that, that what we were doing. Two, we didn't have the time to devote to it. Um, I also contracted my way just doing odd jobs through high school, parts of college, decks, blah, blah, blah. That I was doing part time. That made some money. In college, my brother again and I did a online game. It was a for the time, massively multiplayer online game. It had about 100 people at the peak. It's still running. It's got about 40 now. We started charging for it. We made a little bit of money. We probably could have made a go of it if we were doing it full time. But I was in college. He was in high school, actually. And we didn't. And as a result, it never, it didn't fail as such, but it never really thrived. And so when we were doing this one, there was, there was no conception of, well, I'll just do this kind of part time. And we work in the hobby industry. The hobby industry, airplanes, robots, hacking, electronics, things like that, is full of little companies that guys are doing in their spare time. And I'm going to say it doesn't work. It doesn't work for one very important reason. You grow to the point where you die. If you're working two hours a week, then when that gets full up, you work four hours a week. When you're working four hours a week, that gets full up, you work six hours a week. You're still working your regular job, and because you're working your regular job and doing this on the side, you haven't raised a whole heck of a lot of money, most likely. If you did, grand. But chances are you're saying, well, this is kind of a hobby. This is, this is what I'm doing for fun. This is what I'm doing for gratification because my job is boring. I do whatever I do. And you see a lot of companies like that. And what happens is they grow to the point where they can't ditch it for their regular job because they're not making enough money and they haven't done the financing rounds. They don't have enough money to say, well, I can make a mortgage payment on my four week job. That's on the side. But they can't not grow because if you don't grow, where are you going? As a, I mean, if you're a plumber, growth is kind of, yeah. Don't, don't, don't raise your hand, just, just yell out. Right. Business relies on their individual contribution every day. Uh, it's not the only art of delegation. It's all. About, I agree. You know, so I own, I own a successful business okay. that I could actually pay. Well, I do pay actually a mortgage for one of my houses based on the income from that business. Right. And uh, I, I, you know, I don't run that business every day. Really? What do you do? I manage the people who. No, 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 no. I mean, what what does your business do? Uh, HIPAA compliance audits for uh, healthcare firms and. Okay. Medical, I'm um, sorry, law practices. So we our, our also offer a wide variety of vertical services to bring you back into compliance, of course. Fantastic. Um, so what I'm really hearing you saying, is what I'm hearing is, it depends. It depends on what you're doing. It, it does. The hobby industry is a big difference than if you're a consultant or if you're making Main Street Business software. I mean, it's a whole, there's a lot of difference. And a lot of it depends, no problem. And a lot of it depends on your business skill. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you there. I could probably right now start a company part-time while doing mine. But when you're a startup, when you are at the very beginning of your process, you probably don't, if you're coming from my perspective as an engineer, coming from many of the people here's perspective as an engineer or an IT guy, you probably don't have a lot of business skills. Do you agree? Uh, yeah. Okay, so at that point, I'm going to say that you can't do it part-time with no prior startup experience 
and grow to the rate that you're going to go. Or you can, but I'll, I see a lot of people die. A lot of people die because they say, well, I'm doing well, I'm doing well, I'm doing too well, but not well enough to ditch. And at that point, they're squeezed for time, and the only thing that's really, really valuable in a startup is time. So anyway, I'm going to go back to my um, experiences. You know, this is, this is kind of how I'm going to run the talk, is I will kind of talk on my experiences for a while, what I learned personally, and then try to generalize. And if people want to disagree with me, then I'll, I'll, I'll roll with that. OK, so 2004. I graduated. I had no job, no prospects, no, you know, I've got a little gold star saying, yeah, you're real smart. Um, so what did I do? I moved back with my parents. That was the hardest thing I have ever done, personally, just for my pride. You and 70% of every other college graduate. Yeah, but me and 70%, I got a degree in fucking engineering. The whole social contract was, you get a degree in engineering, you get a job. You get a degree in engineering, you get a job. Not, didn't happen, didn't work out. But the point of moving back in with my parents is, I didn't see any other way that I could cut my living expenses low enough to pull off startuping while doing it. So one of the important things to remember is you have to go all in, even if you're doing it part time. You have to be willing to say, this is what I'm doing, and this is where it's going, and I'm not, not being a pussy about it. I will do whatever I have to do to make this thing work. Because if you're willing to do whatever you have to do to make the thing work, the thing isn't going to work. And the thing isn't going to work because all there is is you. So we moved back in with my parents. We started business planning. Or I moved back in with my parents, rather. Um, yeah, fortunately, my business partner, um, his parents are somewhat wealthier than mine. So they were just like, here, have some money. Live. Not jealous at all. Whatever. Um, so then we started doing research. And it's important, in my opinion, to do your research and do your even early product development before you start. Because once you start, once orders start pouring in, if your ducks aren't relatively in a row, and they won't be, but if you're, if you're still trying to do research at that point, you are in somewhat trouble because you're trying to answer phones, you're trying to fill orders. There's going to be a period of time between I'm open for business and I have people for that. And during that time, the amount of actual technical work you can do is depressingly, depressingly low. So if you're ready or looking to start a tech startup like we were, you need to have your tech kind of going before your startup kind of goes because honestly, even now, we're, my company is five people right now, I spend maybe 25% of my time doing engineering. Maybe. I agree. But. You're running the company? That's what you're doing. That's what's worth the part. Yeah. The more you become a manager, the less actual real stuff you can do. Yeah, no, I, I, and I agree with you 100%. But if you're making a tech-based startup, your tech is where you're going from. And if your tech is where you're going from, your tech has to be better than the next guy. Um, part of when, when you're starting up is you need to pick a niche. And you need to pick a niche where you can beat the established competition with both hands tied behind your back. Um, not even one hand. I, uh, Stop it. OK. Um, Disagreeing <laughs> is good. About necessarily saying your tech has to be better than it. OK. Uh, it depends. I mean, the, kind of the key example there is McDonald's makes really horrible, crappy hamburgers, but they're everywhere because they have really good business processes. So if you can develop, deliver consistent products that are mediocre, um, frankly, a lot of times that'll take over in the market opposed to developing a superior product, but you can't deliver consistency on a wide scale. But your tech isn't your product in that point. Your tech is your business process. OK, fair enough. Um, you, you have to find, what can I beat the established people I beat with both hands tied behind my back. Because one hand, I don't know how to manage, and I don't know how to run a business. Other hand, I have no money versus the guy who's been established for 10 years. So now, who can I kind of kick to death? So one of the great things about now, as opposed to 50 years ago, is the internet, honestly, lets you be much nichier, especially at first, than, you don't like nichier as a word? OK, you can be much nichier. Absolutely. You can be much nichier than you could have been when your customer base was the guys who can drive to me. And that's good, because you can find a little niche where there was maybe one guy who hasn't improved in 20 years. He's kind of complacent. And you can go beat him. 
And that's, I, in my opinion, unless you have buku bucks and million dollar venture capitalists and four successful businesses started into your name, in which case, what the hell are you at my talk for? Um, that you need to beat somebody who you can beat hobbled, completely hobbled, because right now, my business could beat another business, even if they had better tech, like you said, because we know what we're doing now versus we didn't three years ago. When you start, you are not going to know what you're doing. You are kind of going to be fumbling and groping, and you need to have something where it's so good that you can beat people who actually know what they're doing while you fake it. Um, and 2004, we started up. We actually had no revenue in 2004. We incorporated. We got facilities. We got processes. We actually manufacture all of our products in-house. And right now, we make about 2,500 little electronic boards a month. And so we had to learn how you do that, because I'm a mechanical engineer. My business partner is an electrical engineer. Neither of us has any manufacturing experience. Um, so that's what we were doing in 2004. We were setting up. We were ready to go. Come 2005, our business plan said, hey, you're supposed to be selling, selling, selling. And we're like, well, shit, we ain't even got products. So your business plan is a lie. But if your business plan doesn't say, I'm going to be rich next year, you're not going to not never. What are our products are the most handmade? Are they made in Malaysia, or how do you? No, our products are made in Akron, Ohio. We have an automated SMT line. We stuff them. We test them. We make them. Our products are neither the cheapest nor the most expensive. Our niche is we try to be easier to use. Our um, our goal, our end user is mostly research students, hobbyists, hackers, and most of them don't know everything there is to know about electronics. And even if they do, they don't care. What we try to do is we try to make our products easier to use than the next guy. If the next guy is going to take four hours of setup, ours drops in, you flip two switches, and it goes. That's what we've tried to, that's kind of the niche we've tried to get into in power electronics. And the reason we got into our niche is because what was there sucked. It sucked to the point where we could beat them with both hands tied behind our back. And at this point, we're kind of established. Um, but no, our, our, our particular niche, we try to compete a little bit on price only because our competition is hand assembled for the most part, especially in the uh, hobby robotics part. And we are being machined. We can eat their lunch on cost. We also, because we're doing it full time, much of our competition is doing it kind of, well, I make a couple of them in my spare time in my basement. And because of that, they're using very integrated solutions. They're using driver chips, where we're building the whole thing out of FETs. You know, we're ha our time into a product that they might have spent 100 hours designing is 2,000 hours. But as a result, our per unit, we can eat their lunch. But price is not the way to compete, because if all you've got is price, China can beat you on price. China can always beat you on price, regardless of how clever you are, because exactly. It's, it is a bad game to play. If you say, yeah, if, if you say my, my goal, my plan, what I can do better is I can be cheaper, come up with a new plan. It's an excellent, excellent point. <laughs> you can come over here. Uh, we don't have our stuff manufactured in China because there is a major knockoff industry, especially in the RC airplane stuff, in China. Exactly. The Chinese manufacturers are very, very good at being very, very lazy, which is not a bad thing. Laziness is good. If, you're for be if you can be lazy and win, you should be because it's cheaper. Um, but it's true. They don't invent other things in other countries. They steal ours and make it better. It's true. They don't even necessarily make it better. But we've had competitors who have said, hey, I'm going to have my stuff manufactured. It's a $30 product. All of a sudden, you say, wow, there are $10 exact clones coming out of China. How the hell did that happen? They can, but they don't. Because if you send them the schematics, the boards, the everything, it's much cheaper to say, well, you know, take the one from the competitor who has said, make it in China. If China knows how to make it, because you gave them all the information to make it, they're just going to make an cu extra couple thousand, an extra hundred thousand. Yeah. I'm doing research on Cogro key sets. I'm doing research on Cogro key loggers. I noticed some of the ones I'm getting are from foreign countries. And the IC chips have been sanded off. What numbers are actually in them? Yeah. Is that one of the reasons they do that? Is to keep people from easily cloning them? It's that's why people do that. 
it's not really that great an idea because there, there's, there's a giant cloning stuff industry in China. So if they, if they want to clone it, they're going to. You, you can't prevent that. Um, but the so the reason we manufacture in-house is mostly so we don't get knocked off and partially because that's just kind of the way I work is I prefer to have I have control over the whole process and I prefer to have well if it can be made I'll make it instead of some guys well these are our manufacturing tolerances and you can't do anything weird we manufacture in-house so it doesn't get ripped off and we manufacture in-house so we can do weird stuff and we do some weird stuff simply because partially we didn't know that we shouldn't have done the weird stuff and partially because it's fun. It's because it's fun, yes. I'll, I'll take that. I'll definitely take that. So in 2005, we were growing exponentially. So our growth rate was great. Our absolute numbers were small. Um, the entire year of 2005, we did about $35,000 in sales, which was not, you know, business plan said, hey, you're supposed to be making a quarter of a million dollars, but the business plan lies. The business plan is a convenient lie that says, if everything goes well and I know what I'm doing, here's what I'm doing. If that doesn't, you know, if your business plan numbers aren't great and huge and grand, your real numbers won't work. But I'm going to sh share with you a little story from uh, 2005, which is a little bit about being a startup and a little bit about the industry I'm in. 2005, August, September, we were doing about $5,000 a month in sales, which is not and we were making like 250 bucks as a month in salary, but, but we were growing. Then you had a couple of hurricanes hit. We're in the hobby industry. We're in the research industry. We are completely based on discretionary income. The price of gas went from what, like a buck 80 to $3.25. In the month of September, we had done $5,000 in sales. We had about $5,000 in the bank, and that was a, we were burn, burning through about $5,000 a month. In the month, uh, the month following, right after Hurricane Rita hit, the first three weeks of the month, we did 500 bucks in sales. And our cash position went down to just about nothing. We were honestly looking at, okay, do we sell the equipment? Do we go get real jobs? We're, are we fucked? What's going on here? And what was going on was the price of gas. The price of gas, you know, our customers aren't really, you know, all of our markets that we go into, people have discretionary income. They're not, they could have afforded to buy our products, but consumer confidence and the sentiment was, well, is gas going to be five bucks a month, dollars a gallon next week? Maybe. So nobody was buying anything. And so November, we were like, well, if this doesn't improve, we're, we're literally dead. Um, Fortunately, we went to an event, and I was talking to other people kind of in the same industry, and they're like, yeah, uh, nobody's sold anything this month. So that made me feel a little bit better. But that was the closest we ever came to being completely out of business, and it had nothing to do with anything we were necessarily doing wrong. It was hurricane blew through. People said, well, I'm not going to buy any motor drivers or anything along those lines because I just paid a lot of money for gas. As a startup, you are perpetually on the risk of death, the brink of death, and it doesn't take anything more than that to kill you. And honestly, at that point, we got lucky. We got lucky that consumer gas prices went back down, they fixed the refineries, and we were under $1,000 in cash reserve when things started picking up again. Yeah. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Okay. So that was 2005. 2006, we were still continuing to grow. We, um, in 2006, in February, we hired our first non-owner employee, uh, which was an assembly tech part-time, just stuff things, wire boards, things like that. Um, in 2006, we also hired our second employee, which was a office manager, receptionist, shipping. Karen's a wonderful, wonderful girl. Um, part of working in a startup is you have to wear a lot of hats. You can't say, well, this, this, is, my, this is my job. I answer the phones. Okay. And in the 99% of the time when somebody's not calling, I pack products. And when people aren't packing, when there aren't products to pack, I do our website. And 
doing a startup, you don't really have a job description. You just have a, well, what needs to be done today? Um, it's one of the advantages of being a startup is you get real broad. The disadvantage of running a startup is you don't get very deep. So you have, to, you have to learn to know a lot of things, and you have to be able to jump. You have to be able to jump really fast. OK, well, that just caught fire, so I'm going to have to stop doing this. Go to Google. How do I put out a fire? Go to Home Depot. I need a fire extinguisher. Go over to the fire and say, you are much bigger now. <laughs> Go over to um, the fire department and say, I have a problem. Which, you know, it's, it's a fallacious example, but that's the sort of thing you have to do, not necessarily with fires, but all the time in a startup is, OK, what's going wrong? How do I fix it? I probably don't know how to fix it, because I may not have encountered it before. So I have to, you have to be constantly on your feet, and you have to be constantly learning. And you have to be willing to wear any hat from janitor to machinist to throw on a suit and give a presentation to the Cleveland Cavaliers for some customer, which I did a couple of months ago. Um, so we were continuing to grow. 2006, we were growing, growing, growing. And at one point, some point in 2000, I really stopped being an engineer, and I started being a manager because when you're just working for yourself, you know what's going on. You, you know what you need to do. The thing with employees, and employees are wonderful, and I love them, and they absolutely make your hair turn white, um, is you have to kind of think for them or ahead of them. Or instead of saying, well, I'm, I'm me. I'm designing this thing. You say, well, I'm me. I'm designing this thing. I'm Tom putting together this. I'm Karen. I'm doing this. I'm Alex. I'm doing this. You know, the, the guy in charge, one of the difficult things about startuping is you have to run from doing everything to still doing everything through other people. You have to be kind of living vicariously in a number of places because the hard thing about having employees is if the employee doesn't have something to do, what they're going to do is, hey, eight on the nine, and that's not really their fault. If you can't manage, you should not design a fast growth startup because at some point you're going to have to. It's not their fault if they're playing solitaire because you didn't give them anything to do and you still have to pay them. So if you're starting up, if you're a startup, if you're to the point where you have employees, which if you're not, you're not really a startup. You're more of a small business because the whole point of a startup is to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and then have a private jet and a mansion and hookers and blow and whatever, whatever's driving you. Um, so so you, have to, you have to manage. And in 2006, what we also started really pushing up against was burnout, um, which is not something I've actually fixed yet. Because, but you know, you're working 14-hour days. You're making, at that point, I was making, what, like 25 grand a year? Oh, no. I that one out. How to fix the burnout? Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's something which you need, if you're thinking of getting into a startup, you need to know that you're not going, it doesn't get easier. It doesn't get easier if you say, well, I've got a million dollars a year in sales. Well, great, now I've got a million dollars a year in expenses that I have to make happen. It, it doesn't, I don't think there's a point where it gets easier. And it really just kind of seems to get more and more and more difficult the larger and larger and larger you grow. So you, you, have, to, you have to be able to, to deal with that. You have to have coping mechanisms because otherwise you're, that's an easy way to die. And it's something we're fighting against real hard right now. Um, I took up skydiving. Why? It's kind of relaxing. Um, so 2007, now what we're pushing up against, what we're worried about, our problem is right now we're capacity constrained. The machines we bought in 2005, 2004, aren't really big enough. Our facility isn't big enough. Um, we don't really have, I don't know that we can afford a two-week downtime while we say, ah, go get new machines and move. Um, but at some point, you come to a spot where you say, well, now what? Right now, we are finally, our business plan we wrote for one year. One year of business plan. We're off our business plan now. We're past our business plan now. Um, at this point, we're kind of at a transitional phase need to either get a hell of a lot bigger or sell or those are pretty much our options. Get bigger, sell, or die. Those are always your options in the startup. But 
you get to a certain point at some point when those are your only options. You can't just continue on and cuz your whole the whole game is fast growth and when you bump up against something what do you do? And that that's kind of where I don't know. I don't know exactly because we haven't done that yet. At the point I'm kind of like, well this is what I did. Where am I going? Bigger, I think. We're kind of in talks with one of our competitors. He's making, oh, I should buy you motions. Would I sell? Maybe. Depends on what he gives us money for. Well, you know, if, if, if his offer's right. right. Yeah, you, you all, you, if he backs a truckload of money up, we say, hey, yeah, I'll go live in Kansas. Grand. Um, if he says, here, 200 grand for your business, I'd say, well, nice talking to you. But you, you have to be open to your options, but you have to be able to say, I'm at a point where this is a transitional point. I need to, I need to make a decision here. Um, honestly, I wish we had made a three-year business plan, which would have taken nine years, back when we had the time and the relaxation and the freedom to sit there and be like, okay, what would all the other clever products? You know, the farther out you plan, the less re bearing on reality it gets. But it would be nice, it would have been nice, in hindsight, to write a longer plan. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of other things in startupping. Um, if you're married, I don't know how many people here are married, and you're thinking of doing a startup, in your business plan, put your divorce. I'm not saying you're going to get divorced. I am saying if you say, well, I'm going to live off my wife's income while I do this, you're fucked. Um, because startuping, is, it's hard enough, and it's hard to relate to. So if you aren't prepared to lose that, you probably shouldn't do it, because you will change in the of running your startup. I wasn't married. I was actually engaged to a lovely girl. Um, and for two years, she kind of stuck through the whole startup thing. And now I'm single. Um, it happens. You, you need to be able to risk that. I don't know how many people that's speaking to. But there are a lot of divorced business owners. Um, and it's not necessarily because you were workaholic, because you don't have a choice. It's not necessarily because you're person, it's just you have to be able to realize that if I'm starting a business, I'm starting this business. And I don't know who's going to be around me when the business succeeds because, because it gets kind of weird. Um, my last thing is, you know, you're, you're talking to me, you're listening to me, you're arguing with me, which is fantastic, thank you. Um, you know, are we rich yet? And I could say, well, my accountant says on paper, but not really yet. Um, I'm making almost an engineer's salary now. We're making payroll. We do payroll for five. Um, you, I could probably say, yeah, this is, this is a win. But if you're running a startup for, to satisfy your ego, that's a good, good way to go. If you're running a startup because it's true. Um, if, you, if you don't have an oversized ego, you're not going to say, well, I can be better than a uh, you know, dude in a suit and yeah, you, 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 running a startup for an ego is a grand thing. Running a startup for, you know, just this is something I need to do, that's a perfectly valid thing. If you're saying, well, I'm going to do this because I want to be Scrooge McDucking through gold coins, you know, surrounded by scantily clad women doing lines of blow. Yeah, it's a great dream, but it's a bad way to go because in a couple of years you'll say, well, where coins, where's the blow, where are the women, where's my mansion? Um, well, you know, it would be much easier to do that if you simply worked a job, got off at 5 in the afternoon. I work about 12 hour days for whatever that's worth. Yeah. Yeah, okay, fine. Your girls Gone Wild would have been a great startup opportunity. What can you do better than ever anyone else? Convince girls to take their shirt off. If that's your talent, go for it. But don't do it necessarily just for the money. Do it be, if you're looking to do it, because the money probably won't be there. What? Right, do it for the girls picking up their shirt. Do it for, do it for pride. Do it for, America. sure, do it, do it for America. Um, <laughs> but the finances may come, but if you're doing this simply because I want to be super rich, you're going to be super poor before you ever get super rich, and you may never get super rich. So there are lots and lots of reasons to run startups. There are lots of reasons to start startups. 
one of the best reasons to start startups is I personally just love to create. And the greatest thing about a startup is nobody can say, well, that's not economically viable except me. And if it's not economically viable, I'm going to find that out real fast. I was like, well, I got a product nobody buys, but damn, it was clever. <laughs> not that, but not that clever. That is the greatest thing about running a business, about running a startup, is there's, there's no illusion of, well, I, I should be doing better. I, there, there's no I should. There's only I is, because I is me. I is it. I is the company. Um, I is not an English major, by the way. I is an engineer. Um, so that's, that's pretty much all I've got for um, start up, startups. Um, if anybody wants to talk or question or discuss. Have you thought about doing funded research? Like, uh, actually, you're, you're currently successful, right? Uh -huh. you, you're making payroll. Yeah. You're, you're paying your bills. Yeah. Uh, that's We're growing sense, about right? 250%. So have you thought year. about maybe taking, it's, uh, you're currently reinvesting all of your current yeah. profits into the, into growth. Mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about taking a percentage of that and doing research for, for future growth, building a new business plan or an, a, a better product line? Um, more products? Well, we, not, not as a discrete thing because, honestly, I, that, this, this is actually an interesting point. I mean, you don't point. have to shut your research. No, no, I, I, I understand and that. funded research is always better than non-funded research. Funded research is better. We definitely have one I of love the customers paying me to yeah, make things of, better for them. One of the great them. perks of running a startup is toy money. The one thing I have is toy money. If, you know, because I kind of took my hobbies and turned them into my business, which unfortunately means that I had to pick up new hobbies. You know, but as, as, as kind of a tangent, don't necessarily take your hobbies and turn them into your business, because it doesn't matter how much you love them, it doesn't matter what your hobbies are, as soon as they become work, they're no longer, they're not going to be fun. It doesn't matter if you're a model railroader or an infomaniac. When you go pro, it's going to stop being fun. Hallelujah. I've done that twice. It's a huge mistake. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> you will learn. If you don't learn the lesson the first time, you will learn it the second time. And if you don't learn it the third time, you're broke. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, from an engineer standpoint, how, engineer standpoint, how do you determine when to ditch a project? When to ditch a project? Um, it's hard, actually, because if you said, this is my project, this is my baby, you become emotionally invested in it. But it usually becomes fairly apparent where this project is going nowhere. We've got about, we have 26, 27 products right now. Um, we also have another dozen that are either backburnered or ditched. Or, you know, usually you either can't afford to continue to research, the research isn't going anywhere, or it's just not, it's just not panning out. Um, one of the things we do is we have a lot of products that we sell some of instead of one major product. So it's easier for us to kind of have vanity products because they're not make or break. Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer for when do you ditch, except that if you've been doing it for a while, you, it, it'll become pretty apparent that, you know, maybe this is clever, maybe this is cute, maybe this is intellectually gratifying, but it's just not going to turn a product, profit for me. But you know, if you want to if you want to follow a product follow a project to the ground, it's your business. It's your prerogative. But usually, it's it's pretty apparent when this is not this isn't going to work. This isn't hacking it. This isn't going to do it. But I don't have a well. If you've invested X amount of dollars, I don't have a formula for that as such. But if if your gut says ditch, ditch. You know, you you kind of have to get good gut feelings about what's going to work and what's not pretty quick. Yeah. Make the make the mic girl work. Which one is in there? Back corner. So the title of the talk seemed to be like, what are you doing in an Ohio for? But from everything I've heard, it didn't seem to match your venture capital or tech skilled personnel wise or networking wise. It sounds like you could have done this anywhere. I could have. Were there, was there anything about Ohio in particular that was especially good or especially bad? Or Akron or where, where, where do you want to? The parents. There you go. Okay. Um, kind of but part of what I would have liked to have gotten to, but I'm kind of a space cadet, so I didn't, is it doesn't really matter, would have liked to hit it hard, it doesn't really matter anymore where you are unless you need more highly skilled labor. You know, if you, if you need oil drillers to make your product work, Ohio's not going to work. But if you're, if you're already, if your core of your 
skilled talent is yourself, you can pretty much locate anywhere. And Northeast Ohio is beautiful with lovely weather and temperate climates. And uh, the, cost of the cost of living is fantastic. That is, that is a very good point. The cost of living in Ohio is almost as good as the South. Um, but yeah, so the, my point is, you can start a tech company in Ohio. You don't have to go to Silicon Valley. You don't have to go to Research Triangle. You don't have to go to Cleveland. Um, you, where, wherever you think you can make it go, you can make a go of it anymore. Um, so why Ohio is more of a why not Ohio? Because you're in Ohio doesn't mean I can't start a company. I can't start a tech company. I can't start a fantastically successful tech company. Um, so. The fact that you're in Ohio and the fact that I am in Ohio doesn't disqualify anyone from anything. Um, the fact that the business climate may suck. The business climate sucked when I graduated and we started. It doesn't disqualify you. Um, only thing that disqualifies you is you. And that's the great thing about startuping is why Ohio? Why not Ohio? You're here. You're established. Make a go of it. You know, I wanted to mention that you had mentioned that you were required to have a business plan. Uh -huh. Eleven years ago, I started a tech startup company and uh, went to the bank to get my first round of financing, which I got uh, with a co-sign with my father. The uh, bank wanted a business plan. I pretty much told them to go screw themselves, to be honest with you. Um, because I was a tech company, they wanted to know, where do you expect to be in five years? And I said, I'm an Internet technology company. <laughs> Do you think everybody knows where we're going to be in five years? Right. So I just wanted to make that point that there are places where business plans can be intimidating and they are required longer as you get established. But, you know, uh, I, I think it's important to keep that perspective. So No, I, I agree. You, you, I just think from a planning standpoint, it's much – you have to make sure that the numbers kind of work in your blue skies. This is – you know, if, if you don't have a directed, if you don't have a blue sky, if you don't have a, this is what I'm going to be doing, it's very easy to say, well, am I doing well? I don't know. Am I behind? I don't know. What am I making tomorrow? I don't know. Um, I, I, not necessarily even, even if you didn't need it to get financing, which uh, fortunately we didn't. We um, managed to raise enough money from friends, family, and fools to uh, avoid banks, which was nice. Um, so we didn't necessarily have to have a business plan. It was excruciatingly useful for us to make. Um, but if, you know, like I said, no wrong way to start up as long as you actually start up and go. So. My point was that sometimes the bank actually appreciated the honesty. Sometimes. Oh, okay. The bank appreciated the honesty. Uh, yeah. You know, they found that refreshing, to be honest with you. And it, I, think, I think it actually helped us get that first round of financing. When, when you said, I, I have no idea. You know, because be. everybody comes to them with some bogus you know, to be honest with you, BS. Yeah, no, uh, business, business plan. So business plans are 100% um, BS, but I, I personally think they're very useful BS. But yeah, you, you, the other thing is you can't you can't lie to yourself and make a go of it simply because the cold hard reality of going broke won't let you. you which is nice. Poverty is, good Poverty is an excellent motivator. One of the questions is, if you're not broke. How do you stay hungry? And that's one of the ones maybe in a couple of years I'll come back and be like, hey, here's how I motivated myself to, uh, to keep going. Because right now I'm, we're doing well enough that I'm comfortable. And god damn it, it would be easy to just get lazy. Well, no, it, it's, it isn't really so much that I'm not a greedy person. We're just at a bad spot where an extra 10% wouldn't get me you know, three extra wives. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is that, uh, we're out of time? Yeah. Alrighty. <laughs> and.